Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today I'd like to take us back to the Middle Ages. And the subject I want to discuss is the evolution of arming swords in the medieval period, particularly in the High Middle Ages. Now, I know what you might be thinking, but the High Middle Ages are not a middle-aged crisis that involves drug taking. Uh, it's a specific period in time in the Middle Ages, as I'm sure most of you know. So, the Middle Ages as a whole encompassed nearly a thousand years. Most historians mark the Middle Ages from the fall of the last Roman Emperor in 476 AD until the fall of Byzantium to the Turks in 1454 AD. So, just short of a thousand years. And that's a long time. And things obviously changed. Now, what I want to look at is a specific period of the Middle Ages known as the High Middle Ages. And that was from the year 1000 until the year 1300. And I'd like to take a look at how arming swords evolved during that period. And an arming sword is basically a broadsword that's wielded with one hand, right? As opposed to a long sword or a bastard sword. So let's take a look at swords in the High Middle Ages. Well, I'm going to apologize for the wind noise. Um, it was blowing a gale, and I do use an external microphone covered with a dead cat, but uh, sometimes the wind just overcomes that, and uh, this uh, it sounds like this is going to be one of those days. So, sorry, I hope it doesn't ruin the video for you. Well, before the High Middle Ages, we had the Viking Age, and that is generally... Uh, agreed to have begun in 793 AD with the raid on the abbey at Lindisfarne in England and to have ended anywhere from the late 900s to 1066 AD. And the Viking era basically had this type of sword. And we're going to be talking about uh, Everett Oakshot's typology when we talk about swords. So I'm just going to give you a little quick look at that. Just so that you'll understand it. But it's just a way of grouping swords according to blade shape. And these Viking swords all had what Oakshot would have called a Type 10 blade, which has a very wide fuller, fairly parallel sides, and a not too acute point. So this sword was mainly a slashing sword, but it had enough of a point to be able to stab as well. And during the Viking era, not many people had a great deal of armor. I mean, most of what you're going to find, of course, is everybody had a shield, everybody had a spear. Those were the two most important weapons. Not everybody had a sword. Uh, they, were, they were fairly high status weapons and quite expensive during the Viking era. However, uh, armor generally consisted of just an iron helmet, usually with a nasal piece, and possibly a male shirt. But those would have been fairly rare. So, a slashing sword was quite effective because against an unarmored opponent these are going to cut off arms, cut off legs, cut off heads. They are going to be extremely effective swords. So fast forward now to the High Middle Ages and let's take a look at how these swords changed. And you'll notice a real common characteristic of these swords is a very small cross and different types of pommels but a very uh, a very short grip and a very abrupt pommel. All right so that's the Viking era sword. Now let's take a look at the beginnings of the swords of the age of chivalry. Well let's say it's 1066 and you're involved in the Battle of Britain. Uh, on any of the three sides what are you likely to have as a sword? Well, you are quite likely to have a sword very much like this. So this is also 
an Oakshot Type 10 blade. You can see very wide fuller, slightly tapered sides, mostly parallel, and kind of a spade point. So this, this sword, just like its Viking predecessors that it evolved from, is mainly a slashing sword. Now it can be used for the thrust, right? But I mean, its main power is in slashing. Now, this has a longer cross than the Viking swords had, and it's got, uh, it's got a pommel that evolved from the Viking swords. So that's called a Brazil nut pommel. And that eventually is going to morph into a disc pommel for most of the high middle ages. But these swords had both disc pommels and Brazil nut pommels. Brazil nut pommels are a little bit earlier. The sword has a longer cross, and the Viking swords were mainly meant to be used on foot. This sword was meant to be used from horseback, with a shield on one side, and the sword actually providing active defense on your right side. And that's one of the reasons why a longer cross is handy, because you're going to be doing a lot more parrying with the sword. In, in the Viking fighting style, you would have had a round shield that you would have held out pretty far, right? And that would have guarded your hand. And the hand was still pretty vulnerable then, obviously. But now you're going to be using a kite shield that you can't move around your horse's neck. So you need a little bit more hand protection. This is still a slashing sword because it's a cavalry sword. And that's mostly what you're going to be doing from horseback, is slashing, either at infantry or at other cavalry. All right? And this, of course, was a secondary weapon. Your primary weapon was your lance. Now, armor is a bit more prevalent among the knightly class. Uh, among the infantry, you're pretty much still where you were in the Viking era, where you've got an iron hat, a shield, and that's about it. Um, you know, the, the more well-to-do minor landholders might have a, a male shirt, but they would not have been common. Now, among the knightly class, which, of course, is becoming much more prevalent on the Continental forces, like Duke Williams, you're going to have a hauberk, which is a male shirt that is half-sleeved and comes about down to mid-thigh. And that gives quite a bit of protection from a slash. Right, you're also going to have a male coif, which is like a full face covering hood, and a helmet, and your shield. But you still have your arms exposed, you've got a lot of your leg exposed, so there are still some pretty good targets for a slashing sword. But this is becoming a bit more problematic. Armor maintained that same configuration right up through the middle of the 12th century. So, you know, we go right through, let's say, uh, the anarchy under King Stephen with the Empress Matilda, everybody fighting for the throne, until King Henry II comes to, to power. And basically, they're using the same swords and armor that they would have used at the Battle of Hastings. But in the middle of the 12th century, that starts to change. From just about 1000 AD up until the middle of the 12th century, say the 1150s to 1170s, the state of weapons and armor remained very much the same. You would have found knights armed with a conical helmet and nasal, a chainmail coif and hauberk that was half-sleeved and left their lower legs uncovered. They would have been using a kite shield, and they would have been using one of these Type 10 swords. And this particular one that I'm showing you is uh, from Dark Sword Armory, uh, and it is excellent. They call it their Type 10. It's a very faithful rendition of an early, early High Middle Ages sword. Uh, with its Brazil, Brazil nut pommel, simple cross, wide fuller, 
got excellent balance and it's very historically correct for the period. And this is the kind of sword that would have been used for like 150 years. And even later, really, because these blades stayed popular, uh, even with more modern styles. But things were about to change, and that's because armor was going to change. And let's take a look at how that evolved. So before we talk about the revolution in armor, in the mid 12th century, I want to talk about two other sword types uh, that were really early 12th century swords. And the first one is a type 10A, and that's what I'm holding here. So that's very much like the Type 10, except rather than having that wide fuller that ran the length of the blade, the Type 10A has a narrow fuller, which gives you a stiffer blade. It's also a thinner blade than the typical Type 10. That meant it was better for the thrust against mail, as well as being a good cutting sword. But this sword evolved into a sword that was a little short-lived, but it certainly has popularity, and that's a Type 11. And the Type 11 looked exactly like this, except it was about six inches longer. So it would have had a blade of, say, 36 to 38 inches in length, and the fuller would have stopped about where this fuller stops. Uh, and it was very popular as a cavalry weapon because the longer reach gave you a better cut from horseback. Now one of the guys who was known for using that uh, was William Long Espy, who was a uh, illegitimate son of King Henry II. And a better son to Henry II than most of his legitimate sons were, I'm sorry to say. And then, He's not the first illegitimate son who was uh, better and more loyal than the legitimate ones. But he was a very tall man, and he used a sword that was a single hand sword. So, so this is almost like a long sword uh, that is used just with one hand. Uh, he was a tall guy, and he wielded an exceptionally long sword, probably a Type 11. Now, my Type 10A actually started off life as a cold steel Viking sword. And uh, it's an excellent sword. I always liked the blade, and it's one of the few 10As I found, good 10As. But the, the grip on it had no relationship to anything ever seen in the historical record. So I went to a friend of mine, Samuel Bakich, Sam, uh, and he is a swordsmith. And I asked him to rehilt my sword, which he did. So he took it from that cold steel pseudo Viking hilt to an acceptable 12th century hilt for a single hand sword. And it is excellent, <laughs> I have to say. I've used this sword quite a bit, and uh, Sam did a great job of, of hilting this. It's, it's not made to be a fancy hilt. This is made to be a working class hilt for, you know, a lower echelon knight, uh, and it's an outstanding sword. So it's good for the thrust, good for the cut, handles well, uh, and it's a semi-custom sword. But these had their, their time of popularity during the 12th century, predominantly. But this sword and the Type 11 uh, also went out of favor. The problem with the Type 11 is it was just too whippy. Its, it's length was not reinforced enough. Uh, 
So it was too weak on the thrust to go through chain mail. And that was going to be a big problem by the middle of the 12th century. Well, the reason that Type 10 swords were still reasonably effective against knightly opponents in the 11th and early 12th century was because armor was not complete. So in the early 12th century, you still had vulnerable arms, basically from the elbow right down to the hand, and you had vulnerable legs from the knee down. Uh, so that meant that a, a chopping sword, a slashing sword, like the Type 10, was still usable. Now, what happened by the middle of the 12th century is that those targets started to disappear. Uh, first, the legs went, because knights started using male leggings called chouses. And in fact, those leggings had existed all the way back into the 11th century. And if you look at the Bayeux Tapestry, you can see that Duke William was wearing chouses at the Battle of Hastings. Uh, but early on, because they were so expensive, only the richest knights, the high nobility, could afford them. But by the middle of the 12th century, they were considered a necessity. And expensive though they may have been, just about every knight was going to get them. So that took away the lower leg as a target. And as the century evolved, armor went from being a half-sleeve affair to being full-sleeved. And then to having a separate mitten of mail that covered your hands, and eventually to having integrated mittens woven continuously with the sleeve. So by the time we get to the 13th century, you've got the knight's entire body covered with male armor. And helmets were improving as well. Uh, by that time, we had the Great Helm, which once again covered the whole face, providing complete protection. Even though it was so hot and vision was cut off so much that a lot of knights, for a lot of purposes, continued to use a conical helmet unless they were going to be in a big battle, in which case they would put on the Great Helm. Right? So, because now they're covered with, with complete mail, and mail was very effective at stopping the cut, right? A slash on mail was not going to penetrate in most cases. Uh, and with the padded gambesons that they wore underneath them, you weren't going to be breaking bones either, right? So a completely mailed knight was pretty much invulnerable to a slashing sword. And because of that, swords had to change. And the first major change was this sword that I have right here. This is an oak shot type 12. And this particular one is made by uh, Albion. Uh, it's part of their Squire line, so it's not their most expensive line, but it's still a darn good sword. So the type 12 looks a lot like the type 10 in that it has a very wide fuller. Right? But the difference is that fuller only runs two-thirds of the blade. And the blade itself is much more tapered, and it comes to a very acute point. So this is both a long slashing sword, but it's also a stiff thrusting sword. And that acute point is able to get inside a link of chain mail. And even if it doesn't break it, it can pink the knight underneath it, go through the gambeson and give him a little nick. But driven hard enough, it can actually break through the rings of chain mail and penetrate right into the knight. So this became a very deadly sword. Uh, these were mostly prevalent at the end of the 12th century and really throughout the 13th century. This was probably the most common knightly sword in the Middle Ages.
There are probably more examples of this found than any other sword. So this was the sword to have, by and large, uh, if you were going to come up against a fully mailed opponent. And, you know, the, the most famous knight of the age was a, a guy called William the Marshal, or William Marshall as he's often called. Uh, eventually he became the Earl of Pembroke. But he started off as a household knight. He was a second son, so he's not going to inherit. Uh, his father had been uh, marshal uh, to um, King Henry in England, but sent him off to relatives in France to be a squire and to become a knight. And of course, William Marshall had no prospects, so he made his money by riding the tournament circuit. And basically, he became a superstar. I mean, it was, it was kind of like, you know, Beckham, right? I mean, he's, he, uh, he won so many tournaments, he was the international champion of uh, knightly tournament fighting. And that brought him a lot of attention. He ended up becoming a major companion of uh, King Henry II's son, the young king, King Henry, where basically... Um, William Marshall was captain of uh, young Henry's tournament team and they rode all around France fighting in tournaments and drinking and carousing having a great time and from there Marshall was serving first young Henry then of course when he died he, uh, he went to serve his father Henry II who was betrayed by his sons Richard the Lionheart and John but uh, Marshall stayed constant to him. Uh, when Henry died, he went to the Holy Land for a while, fought in crusade, came back, loyally served King Richard, and then loyally served King John, even though, as everybody knows, King John was an incredible dick, uh, which Marshall knew. But he had sworn an oath to him, and he stuck by him. And it's largely because of the activities of Marshall that John's son, Henry III, as a young boy, was able to ascend to the throne uh, and, and basically become King of England. Uh, and it was because Marshall was a trusted power broker at the time. He was a, an immensely wealthy earl by then by virtue of marrying uh, a ward uh, a young girl who was the heiress to uh, the Earl of Pembroke. Uh, but he was a heck of a general, he was a trusted advisor, and he was the most famous and most honorable knight in all of English history. And if you look at his, uh, his effigy, he is carrying a sword that looks to be a Type 12 uh, as he's buried. And I'm sure he owned a lot of swords in his life, but Marshall kept up with the latest in armor and weaponry. Uh, in fact, he was still leading men into battle in his late 60s. Uh, Marshall was the ultimate knight. And it looks like he finished up his life in the early 13th century with a Type 12 blade just like this one. Well, the last sword I want to discuss is the Oakshot Type 14. And this sword had its heyday between 1280 and 1320, so just 40 short years. But it was a very popular sword during that period. It was the last sword that was really designed to defeat male armor. And in some ways it resembles a Type 12 that we were just handling. Because, once again, it has a broad fuller that stops about two-thirds of the way down the blade. And then it has a lenticular cross-section, almost a diamond cross-section. Uh, but the difference is this blade is very acutely tapered all the way down the blade to the point. <clears throat> and it's shorter than a Type 12. Typically, these blades are around 30 inches, 28 to 30, 30 inches. So it's a very stiff, very responsive blade. It's very good for the thrust. This blade will, if, if driven by a strong sword arm, will break apart the rings of chainmail and 
penetrate into, into Nate's body. But it still has an effective slashing action, so you can use it against lightly armored infantry. So it's an all-around good sword. Uh, this particular one was designed by Angus Trim, A. Trim, for Kingston Arms. He's a very famous sword designer. And it is absolutely typical of Type 14 swords. And I've got to say, this is one of my favorite swords of the High Middle Ages. Uh, if, if I had to pick a sword for, say, traveling around, right, unarmored, uh, this would be it. Because it's short, handy, very responsive. It can be used for defense as well as offense. And it's a good close quarters weapon. It doesn't have the reach of a lot of longer swords, but it's got all the reach you need. And to be honest with you, having a shorter blade is kind of handy if you're going to be wearing it all the time. Because, let's be honest, right, wearing a sword <laughs> is kind of an uncomfortable thing. I mean, you need a, uh, you know, a 36 inch turning radius because you got this solid tail behind you knocking everything, uh, you know, knocking stools over and bumping into people and just kind of being a pain in the butt. Whereas with this, you can wear it a little straighter down. It's short enough to draw easily and quickly. And it does everything you need a sword to do. It'll slash, it'll cut, it'll parry. So, I like this sword. It's a little late in the period for me because I'm a big fan of the early to mid 12th century as far as the period of history that I like. But when it comes to swords, this Atrium design right here, man, I give this an A+. So this is it. This was the end of the High Middle Ages. Right? In fact, this carried into the Late Middle Ages when plate was beginning to replace mail. Uh, and this was still effective against plate, though it gave way to other designs specifically uh, made to defeat plate armor. Uh, more diamond cross-section instead of lenticular cross-section blades. But this is an outstanding choice, and if you're gonna do an impression of the late 13th century or early 14th century, and you want an arming sword, this is a blade I would choose. So, that's it. That's how swords evolved uh, over the High Middle Ages. Right, we just looked at 300 years of development as armor developed, swords developed to defeat it, and then armor developed to defeat the sword. So, we had kind of a constant battle until you end up eventually in the 15th century with uh, the fully covered, uh, fully plate covered knight. Um, not my favorite period of history. I prefer the male covered guys, but, but this is what we had for swords to, uh, to work during the High Middle Ages. So I hope you liked it. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments if you liked it or if you didn't like it, if you'd like to see more of these or if you couldn't stand it. I know I'm known as a gun guy, not a sword guy, uh, so I'll try to give you plenty of gun content, but every now and then I can't help myself because I just, I love swords and I love the history of the Middle Ages. So if there's anything you're particularly interested in seeing, particularly in the high Middle Ages, uh, let me know. I'll be happy to, to take care of it. And if you like this and you want to see more content like this, hit that subscribe button, give it a thumbs up, and I'll see you again next week.